Are you ready, people? Are you ready? Are you ready to talk about the Godfathers of New Metal, corn, corn with a K? And if you ever want to throw up your dinner and get a little bit sick, go and look up the origin of corn's name. I'm not going to tell you here because I will get demonetized for it, but it's very, very gross. I would advise not doing it, but if you want to, you can. So today, what we will do is take a look through Korn's incredibly large discography, and I will rank them in order from worst to best. And uh, I'm going to have to go quickly through some of these because Korn has an extremely large discography, and it's kind of going to be tough to cover everything, but I will do my very best. So let's get into it with no further delay. The Korn Deep Dive ranked from worst to to best. And also, I wanted to mention something new that I'm doing, which is a YouTube coaching program. If you're an individual creator or you're a company, really anybody that wants to grow on YouTube, this is for you. Basically, this is a way to download everything that I have learned about YouTube over the past seven years from my brain into yours. There's a pretty common set of challenges that pretty much everybody runs into on YouTube. I've run into pretty much all of them. And with this coaching program, I can help you get past those a lot faster than I did figuring it out on my own. For example, in my opinion, the single most important thing for any channel is figuring out the right niche for your content. Like what should you focus on and how do you talk about it? For example, for me on this channel, once I found that I went from getting, you know, a couple hundred views a video to tens of thousands of views per video, literally almost overnight. You can see it right here. And also the right approach to things like titles and thumbnails and how to structure your videos to keep people's attention. All that stuff that took me years to figure out on my own through trial and error. I just want to help you speed run all of that. I am super excited about this and I'm gonna be putting a lot of time and energy into it over the course of the year. And if you wanna find out more about it, you can just hit the link in the description of this video. I'm gonna say that the worst corn album, in my opinion, is the corn untitled album from 2007. This one here with whatever it is, this weird like bird robot thing that looks like an Elden Ring character. The thing with Korn is that Korn is one of the rare bands that, in my opinion, has never put out anything bad. You know, sort of like Slipknot. Korn at their worst is still better than the vast majority of the bands. So I think they have 13 albums. With 13 albums, they can't all be perfect. It's still decent. But in my opinion, it's the weakest one. The second weakest one, in my opinion, is uh, Korn 3, Remember Who You Are, which I believe this is the first one without head, right? This was uh, after he quit the band. And he was the most metal guy in the band. So I think they really kind of lost something with this. You know, it's it's not terrible by any means. Again, Corn at the worst is still pretty good, but I would not choose to ever listen to this one personally, to Corn 3. I'm just getting through these pretty quickly because there's a lot of good albums in their catalog that I want to focus on, or better ones, I should say. So I'm getting through these as quickly as I can. The third worst album, in my opinion is Paradigm Shift from 2013, which is after Monkey came back. Oh, sorry, Head is back. And uh, yeah, I don't think it's horrible. Not horrible, but I wouldn't choose to listen to it. This song made lots of Korn fans angry. Why? What's wrong with it? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't choose to listen to this album or this song, but I don't think it's bad. So that sort of concludes what I would consider the four corn albums that are sort of, you wouldn't say this is bad. You just sort of politely like shuffle it off to the side. Self-titled, Corn 3, Paradigm Shift, and The Path to Totality, uh, which I would say is probably the best of their not great albums. This is an interesting one. I like what they did with it. This was the album that they did with a bunch of different electronic producers like Noisia and Skrillex. This was from 2011, which was actually a little bit before Dubstep really blew up. I wouldn't necessarily choose to listen to this, but I think it's cool that they did it. And remember, this is a couple years before Dubstep really blew up. They were a little bit ahead of the trend. You know, I think at the time people maybe thought that they were hopping on the trend, but they were actually kind of ahead of it. And I think it's cool that they did something adventurous like this, even if I wouldn't necessarily choose to listen to it personally. So yeah, I would put that in uh, in fourth place. So these are the four albums that I would choose not to listen to, self-titled or untitled rather, Corn 3, Paradigm Shift, and The Path Totality. So that brings us to what I would consider the middle of the path of their albums. This is where it really starts to get listenable, and I would never be upset about any of these albums coming on. So the next one in my list, uh, album number five in my ranking is Serenity of Suffering from 2016, which I look at as kind of like a return to form 
they started to kind of get a little bit heavier again with this album. Not my favorite album, but it's pretty damn good, right? Sounds like this could have come out in, you know, 2002 or something in a good way. Sounds like prime corn to me. And remember, they'd been a band for like, 27 years or something like that when this came out so for a very long time so for them to be that deep into their career and still putting out music that's like pretty damn good i think is amazing and so like to me that's the most incredible thing about corn obviously if you've been a band for this long not everything you do is going to be amazing but Almost every band that's been around this long sucks and loses it. And Korn never lost it. Like, even at their worst, it's still respectable. They never put out anything, like, just laughable and bad, right? Yeah, sounds like this could have been on Issues. Exactly. Yeah, we've got Monkey and Head back again, and definitely could have been on Issues, if you ask me. Another good song off this album is uh, this one, Insane. Sounds like Issues to me. Totally solid. This part got the dj in there i will say that uh ray luzier is a great drummer but in my opinion they really did lose something when david silvera quit the band because he was the prototype for every new metal drummer he just had like a sense of groove he's one of these people like ray luzier is probably technically a better drummer you know if you were to sort of just evaluate them on pure like technical ability then I would say Ray's probably better. But David has more feel. Jonathan said David was a limited drummer. Uh, yeah, maybe so. I mean, aren't all musicians limited in some way? You know, like Joey Jordison, I, I would compare him to Joey Jordison in a lot of ways. Like Joey also was like not a technically perfect drummer. Joey and David and the Rev, yes, all have like way more feel, right? Like not perfect, but they have feel. And to me personally, I don't really care about like how technically perfect a drummer is. I care about feel. And so I think they did lose something uh, without him. That being said, yeah, Serenity of Suffering uh, is uh, number five on the list. Number six on the list is uh, The Nothing, in my opinion, which is from uh, 2019. And uh, this was kind of a tough one because this was after his wife died and his mom also died. Jonathan Davis's wife and mom both died like within a year or so of each other. So obviously he's going through a ton of shit emotionally and still found a way to make a record. So yeah, I really respect their grind. I mean, that's insane to like go through all that and then come out with a record that's like actually pretty damn good. I have a ton of respect for that. And this is cool, right? I think this sounds solid. And again, from 2019. Imagine being in a band for 26 years and still sounding this good. Love this part. Actually, one of the heavier parts they've ever done. One of the most metal parts. The next album, uh, which I would say, this one really surprised me. Requiem from 2022. Um, which I fully expected to be trash because, again, at this point, the band had been around for 30 years. How in the world could a new metal band be good after 30 years, right? Impossible, especially a band that started out being so, like, dark and edgy and just, like, fucked up and scary. And somehow, 30 years later, they came out with an album that, in my opinion, is pretty damn good. Cool little tempo change there. This part here at the end is really cool. This totally sounds like it's off the first album, right? Jonathan's vocals still sound amazing. You know, to be able to summon that sort of emotional performance as, I don't know, how old is he now? 50 or something like that? You know, to be able to go to that place 30 years later and still sound like this. Their new stuff has a little Meshuggah influence to it. Maybe. I don't know if Meshuggah has ever talked about it. I feel like Meshuggah has a corn influence. Nobody wants to say this because I guess it's, uh, you know, because people think that somehow Meshuggah is like, you know, too artsy for corn or something. I think Meshuggah just sounds like a heavier version of corn, personally. Like, corn put all this shit on the map. They really popularized the panic chords and you think for sure they did no question about that which obviously they got that from mr bungle as they will tell you um but for sure they popularized the panic chord 
and the contrast of like really low tuned groovy riffs with the panic chord for sure corn popularized that there's absolutely not even popular they invented it nobody was doing that shit corn put down tuned guitars on the map that is a fact that is an absolute fact i know they weren't the first people to play seven string guitars first seven strings i remember uh, Morbid Angel played them in like 1990 or something like that. But Korn is the one that popularized the seven string. There is no question about it. Fear Factory, yeah, look, I love Fear Factory. But no question, Korn is the one that put seven string guitars on the map. That is just a fact. As soon as Korn came out and everyone was like, oh shit, that sounds so cool. Yeah, Steve Vai was early. I know, but it's not about who did it first. It's not about who did it first. It's this. Korn is responsible for the sale of every Ibanez RG seven string between 2002 and 2018. Even earlier than that from like 1994 to 2018. I love Fear Factory. I love Fear Factory and I have a ton of respect for Dino and like, I think he's amazing. But I mean, Korn is like probably a hundred times bigger than Fear Factory. I mean, they were just like all over MTV and shit. And just those like downtuned groove riffs. Nobody did that shit before Korn. Now this is gonna be a controversial one, but the next one on my list, which would be album number eight in the worst to best list. And this would be, the albums that I just talked about here, Serenity of Suffering, The Nothing, and Requiem, and the following one are the ones that I would consider to be the Korn albums that are like good, but not their very best, right? So the best of the good, but not great albums, which a lot of people are going to disagree with me on, is Issues, in my opinion. And I like Issues. I think this is a good album. I do like it, but to me, my thing with Issues is that it's not their heaviest it's not their most poppy it's just kind of in the middle and it's solid i would certainly never i would never be unhappy if somebody put it on but it just kind of doesn't really kind of go too much in either direction yeah issues is a bit flat in retrospect exactly it's not still very good but just for me i wouldn't put it at the top of the list yeah, I just don't really have much to say about it. It's kind of like nothing on there really like stands out that much to me. However, there's also nothing wrong with it. So to me, it's the best of their sort of not amazing albums, in my personal opinion. Which brings us to the place I really wanted to focus my attention on in this video, which is, listen, Korn is such a fucking great band that there's one, two three, four, five, six albums left. There are six albums that they have put out, which I believe of these six albums, any of them I think is a fair choice as the best Korn album. That is how good this band is. They have six albums that are all just like certified classics that could all be chosen as the best in their discography. And I wouldn't argue with you. How many other bands can say that? Where there's six fucking albums that you could validly choose as their best. Their batting average might be the best of like any kind of band in their league, right? I think Korn might have the strongest batting average. So of the kind of uh, the next four albums that I'm going to talk about is what I would call the pop era of Korn, meaning that for a few years here, when they were all over TRL and stuff like that, they were still heavy, but they were writing a lot of songs that were like actually really poppy at the same time. And that's the reason why they were all over MTV and the radio and like, you know, teenagers and stuff were into it. And so of pop era corn, which is, um, in my opinion, some of the best stuff, I would say the next album on the list to me is Untouchables from 2002. I love this song. So catchy. Popcorn, that's right. This is so groovy. Yes, that is Aaron Paul. The mix on this album is fucking unreal, too. I think Jonathan Davis said that they spent like $2 million recording this album, and it sounds like it. This is one of the best mixes of all time. Like, the best new metal mix ever, in my opinion. It sounds so goddamn good. This is what I'm talking about here, like the pop side of corn. This album's next on my list. Damn, damn good album. Kind of underrated, I think. Their best sounding album. I would agree with that. Yeah. Which, yeah, I think Jonathan Davis said that it's his uh, 
his favorite mix they've ever done too, which I agree with. I mean, it's just like unbeatable, like, or untouchable, I should say. Untouchables is untouchable in terms of production. Damn good album. That's what I think. But I think the next album on the list might be a little bit better. And if we're talking about, you know, the pop era of Korn, that brings us to the next album on the list, which is See You on the Other Side. This is one of my favorite Korn songs, Twisted Transistor. Very poppy and great video. Super catchy. It's their sellout album. Yeah, I mean, I can see why you would say that, but I just, I fucking love this song. It's so catchy. This is so catchy. So, so catchy. It's so poppy, right? This is how talented Korn is is that even when Korn does this, which is like unquestionably, like maybe not the most pop album, but like this is a very pop influenced album. And yet it still sounds like Korn, right? It's still like got that like dark, you know, kind of twisted sort of sound that Korn does. Like it is so fucking hard to do that, to basically change genres, but still sound like the same band. Yeah, it's so noticeable when metal takes cues from pop songwriting and it's always good. Absolutely. I love this song. Yeah. The mark of a great artist or band is when their sound is unmistakably them. Exactly. It's like, no matter what they play, it still sounds like them. They can't help it. Like, I agree with that. That to me is what really defines a truly great artist. Yeah, that's true. And the cultural crossover impact of all the hip hop cameos. Exactly. Exactly. And this is like the peak of crunk rap. And again, remember the band had been around for like 10 years at this point and still like evolving, still putting out great shit. Didn't the Matrix help them write this album? They might have. I don't know. It certainly sounds like it if so. But yeah, so that would be the next album on my list, which brings us to what I would consider maybe not quite the peak of pop era corn, but close to it, which is uh, Take a Look in the Mirror from 2003, I think. An underrated album. I feel like a lot of people don't like this one. I do. This is one of my favorite corn songs. Y'all want a single, which is like, again, obviously very like pop influenced. And I think that's maybe why a lot of fans don't like it. I, th I love this album. I love how pop influenced it is. And this is one of my favorite Korn songs. It's so catchy. That bass tone, man. Like a lot of people talk shit on Fieldy's bass. I do not understand it. Like Fieldy is just an absolute God tier bassist. How many bassists? have a tone that he can play literally one note and it's instantly obvious who he is. That's God tier in my opinion. Fans love this song. Oh, well, that's good to know. I thought a lot of people didn't like this one for some reason. <laughs> the message in the video is so subtle, yeah. Listen to how many bands now rip off corn, right? Everybody, everybody rips off corn, Slipknot, and Lincoln Park. But nobody sounds like corn. You like you can hear the corn influences, but they're one of these bands that like it's impossible to copy, right? You just you can't do it. You can borrow little things here and there. But you can't sound like corn. It's impossible to do. For a band that's this influential and this popular, the fact that nobody can successfully, like a lot of people, I think, sound a lot like Linkin Park. Slipknot, you know, they get pretty close, but nobody sounds like corn. You can't do it. Can't be done. So, in my opinion, the peak of the TRL pop era corn, in my opinion, and this is the third best corn album, in my opinion is Follow the Leader, which I think this is the album that really kind of blew him up. And listen to how poppy these songs are. Great video too. I mean, like just this intro here, like nobody can do this shit. Like you'd think you could, right? But this is like one of their signature elements. Everybody knows it, but nobody can do it. This little shit, nobody does this shit. Sounds like a little sample from like a hip hop record. Nobody does it. This song is one of those, one of the best breakdown drops of all time. And the scatting. Like, how cool is this part? Nobody does this shit. Why? It's so cool. That breakdown right there, man. And like his vocals are just fucking unhinged. Totally unhinged. And this song was huge. This was on TRL, literally next to like Backstreet Boys and NSYNC. That's how popular this band is. They were losing to literally like Britney Spears and Backstreet Boys. Hey, 
with this, which was like shockingly heavy. Yeah, so I would say that is the third best album in the Corn discography. But you know, if you said that was the best, I wouldn't disagree with you, which leads us to the final two Corn albums in the top two spots. Now, in my opinion, as much as I love the pop Corn era, when I think of Corn, really what I'm thinking about is what, what I would call the meth Corn era, right? <laughs> when they were still sort of like the unhinged Bakersfield tweakers, you felt like they were still kind of detoxing, you know, and you weren't really sure if the, you're like, are they okay? What's going to happen to these guys? You feel like at any moment they could have just totally self-destructed. There's really two albums here that are contending for the top spot. And some people might be surprised to hear me say this, but the second best album, Corn album, in my opinion, is the self-titled album, their first album, which I loved. And I think it's amazing and great. Underrated song, by the way, Clown. Very underrated song. This song is so fucking dark and sludgy, you know? Nothing sounded like this at the time. So sludgy and just shitty and dirty sounding. David's drumming is perfect in this too. Yeah, it's filthy. I'll tell you about the first time I heard them. I've mentioned this in videos before, but I saw them with Sick of It All on this tour. I think it was right after the album came out, but it's before they got popular or anything like that. It was with Sick of It All and I think Rancid. I'm not sure. Maybe H2. I don't remember, but Sick of It All. They opened for Sick of It All and they gave out a tape sampler with Clown and Blind on it. I saw them play. I had no idea who they were or what, like, I had, like, they they were dressed like ravers, but they had these, like, seven-string guitars, and they played this. I was like, what in the fuck is this? I have absolutely no fucking clue what this is, but it blew me away. And uh, I got that tape, and I listened to it again and again and again, because, like, this kind of, like, groove... Nobody was doing that. Remember, this is 1994. Nobody was doing this shit at the time. I mean, I would consider these two songs, but like especially Blind, to be, you know, they're up there with like Raining Blood and Inter Sandman as far as like the level of influence that these songs had. And I do think this album is absolutely amazing. Completely like classic in every respect. There's not a bad song on this album. There's not a bad note on the album. Everything about it is like as close to flawless as you can get. However, in my opinion, as much as I love this album, the single best corn album, in my opinion, is Life is Peachy because I think Life is Peachy is basically everything about the debut corn album, except better done. It still has that like unhinged like methed out fucking just dark sludgy kind of character but it's just better they just did it better in every way like this shit still sounds great cleaned up just a bit yeah but it's in some ways it's even nastier and darker like listen to that guitar tone it's filthy they could have done a lot of things with this album if they wanted to do something more accessible then they would have done a lot of other things because you know they did a shit like this that was this is just nasty the guitars are slightly out of tune exactly and just all that like weird glitchy kind of stuff you know you hear bands like darko and stuff do that now and obviously a mirror you know, you hear bands like that do this kind of stuff now. They were using their guitars to make sounds that nobody even thought of at the time. You know, them and Rage Against the Machine were like using guitars in ways that just nobody even considered before. Bullshit, fucking, 10 out of 10 I lyrics, too. Cool. Sucking, I still think this album sounds amazing. I just love how filthy and raw it is. And I agree with that. This might be their single best song. To me, this is everything about that early period of corn. Just that like filthy, dark, yeah, bouncy and catchy at the same time. And just it, it just makes you feel like you haven't showered in like three days and you just like got off a meth bender and like you're taking the bus home at like 7 a.m. You haven't slept in three days and like the birds are chirping. You're just about to go to bed after a bender as everyone else is like getting up to go to work and you're on the bus and you can sort of tell that you smell bad. That's how this song makes me feel. <laughs> Just the masters of groove. This riff sounds so seasick and nauseating. It does, yeah. I mean, to this day, nobody, like, you can't do this. Corn is the only band that can do this. Nobody even tries to copy them. 
because you can't. And yeah, that bass tone is insane. Listen to that. Nobody else could do this. All Darko is is just updated corn. That's it. Darko is just more extreme corn. Great lyrics, too. Well, there it is. That is my opinion. The number one corn album, Life is Peachy. But again, I would say there's a solid five or six albums in the corn discography that could all reasonably be called the best in their discography. That is how good they are. The band just does not miss. Even at their absolute worst, they're still damn good. Yeah, probably the strongest batting average in metal, in my opinion. Huge respect to Korn. Big fan. And that does it for this deep dive into the Korn discography. I'm not going to tell you here because I will get demonetized for it, but it's very, very gross.